All right, everyone. So uh, in this chapter, the fraction and polarization, we're gonna continue our investigation of wave optics. In previous chapter, we discussed double slit experiment where to understand how the experimental result, uh, where we see the, instead of two bright spots, we see multiple bright spots, multiple dark spots. In order to describe that, we have to accept the fact that light was a wave because only waves interfere when they overlap and they give us constructive and destructive interferences. All right, so we use the fraction to kind of describe that, which is a phenomenon when light goes through some kind of, uh, through some kind of opening. So in this chapter, we're gonna continue that investigation and we're gonna try to understand the fraction uh, for not only a, a double slit, but also a single slit. And also use that then to look at some of its application like polarization. All right. So remember the, the fraction is um, technically not a light unique phenomenon. It's a wave unique phenomenon. That means, you know, you can, you can have the fraction for uh, any type of waves. In this example here, you can see that uh, you can have a wave that is moving and uh, you can see that those bright spots are basically the, the wave, uh, wave fronts, which means they, are, they represent the crest of the wave. And so that means this distance is the wavelength. And you can see that then you have an opening. So you have a barrier and there is an opening. So you can see that opening is compatible to the size of the wave. And if that's the case, then the light will spread out when it you know, goes through that opening. And that phenomenon, right, when the wave spreads out to fill the space behind the opening is known as a diffraction. Okay, so again, diffraction is um, a clear sign that we're dealing with the with the wave. Here's a sort of like a simulated image, so you can see that as light enters that uh, through the opening, right? Uh, it spreads out. Now, obviously, that um, that opening, if it's very large compared to the wavelength of the wave, um, then the fraction pattern is not as noticeable, let's say, as when the, you know, the opening is very small. So for example, here you can see that um, you have a very large opening and the wavelength, which you can see in terms of the, the this is to be the wavelength, but the opening is much, much larger, right? So you can still have the light going you know, through and there's a little bit of spreading, which you can see sort of like in these regions, but still the light in a way uh, move straight forward without really, you know, spreading like in a, in a previous image that we had. Okay, so this is, you know, uh, there is a defined region, the shadow, where there is no wave. So that's why, for example, in this, you know, in this image over here, you can see that uh, those columns, right, uh, you know, basically block the light. So you can see that those are the light going through the opening, but then, you know, you see, you see shadow. So, in order now for us to be able to um, see a little bit of, um, let's say, diffraction pattern, right? So when we, when we look at those, um, we talked about that the opening should be very small. So you can see that when the opening is small, then the light going through the opening spreads out instead of kind of going forward and giving you just a little bit of shadow on, on the sides. So it spreads out. That means what you get here is it spreads out like that. Okay. And it can, you know, you know, one of the things we talked about in the previous uh, previous chapters that if it's, it's if it spreads out and there are two openings, then they the light can overlap. Okay, but diffraction itself is just you know the phenomenon where wave goes through an opening and spreads out like this. And you can see, right, smaller the opening in terms of like let's say compatible to the wavelength size. Uh, more um, visible the effect of the of the diffraction is more noticeable. Okay. Now, one of the things we have here in this chapter, we're going to study um, diffraction uh, when the light goes through uh, not a double slit but a single slit. Okay. 
So one of the things we have here is uh, before that, let's look at a little bit of also history of, uh, you know, a wave optics. So here you can see that, you know, when we look at the diffraction pattern, um, in terms of a light going through a single opening, here is an experimental result where we're going to see a very bright central maxima, and then you're going to see a dark fringes, and then, you know, kind of like secondary maximas. Okay. So you get, you can see that it is consistent with, um, let's say, a double slit experiment result where you see that uh, bright spots and dark spots, right? Or bright fringes, dark fringes. So um, it's, it's just a little bit different when you're considering um, just the one opening. Okay. So there's a very uh, sort of like dominating a central uh, bright spot. Okay. Now, here's also another example of a light. Uh, so you have a uh, opaque object, which means that, you know, it pretty much will block the light. So if the light going through, you know, and like, let's say you can think of like, let's say light kind of going like this. And then what you have here is there's then the object pretty much blocking the light. So then what you see is that instead of going there and giving us one bright spot, it gives us, you know, a result like that. So diffraction pattern associated with light passing by edge of an object. Okay. And what you see again, you see bright and dark fringes reminiscent of an interference pattern. Okay. All right. So here's a little bit of history. Um, we talked about double slit experiment uh, that was done by Thomas Young in 1801. And that experiment basically um, showed us that light has to be a wave or have some kind of wave properties in order for us to uh, be able to explain the result. Okay, so um, before that, remember the Isaac, you know, Isaac Newton, uh, he was convinced that light was a particle um, and he, he wrote a book obviously in, on optics and because it's Isaac Newton, everybody was pretty much accepting his, uh, his conclusion that the light was a particle until 1801, Thomas Young did this experiment, uh, the double slit experiment. All right, so the double slit experiment uh, very conclusively basically uh, showed that light has to be a wave in order for us to see that pattern. But obviously not everybody was um, agreeing. You know, it's hard to um, let go of, a, you know, let's say something that you learned uh, for, for, you know, for decades and, you know, something that was given to you by Isaac Newton, right? But still, you know, uh, eventually there are experiments uh, that were done to prove that light was a wave. So for example, here we're gonna talk about how in 18, 1818, uh, in French, French Academy of Science, there was um, uh, sort of like a debate where a uh, few people, Simeon Poisson, um, who was a supporter of ray optics, um, argued that um, the light cannot be a wave because if, you know, light is a wave, um, which is uh, proposed by Augustine Fresnel, who was um, another, you know, natural philosopher slash scientist who uh, did a lot of experiments um, and, you know, uh, gave us a lot of theory uh, uh, for the uh, diffraction patterns, right? Um, he basically said that, you know, if the light is a, is a wave, um, then one of the things we will see here is, for example, imagine you have a flashlight and you have the light, and then you put some kind of object in front of it, like a coin, you know, quarter or something like that. So then what you will see here is that if there's a screen, you know, then there will be a shadow, right? Because, you know, the, the, the coin basically blocks, okay? But according to uh, Poisson's calculations, if the light was a part, of, if the sorry, if the light was a wave, then there would be some kind of a central, so some kind of a central, basically a uh, source of light. So that there will be a, a point, a light point, at the center of that, you know, shadow. So basically, he said that if it was well valid, right, a central bright spot should be absorbed in shadow of a circular object illuminated by a point source of light. Okay, so 
light arriving at all points around the edge of object would diffract inward into shadow region, which means that let's say if you if you're looking at this to be the the, the coin, right? Um, so behind the coin you, in, on the screen, you will see a shadow that will give you sort of like, let's say uh, some kind of um, like a, a central bright spot, but also, you know, around the edge of the object, it would diffract and gives you, you know, sort of like a shadow region. So here's a bright and dark, bright and dark and thing like that. Okay. So because center equidistant from all points on the edge, light from all points would interfere constructively there, causing a bright spot. All right. So Poisson basically, you can say, right, consider this possibility to be absurd. Okay. So particles of light would be blocked by objects and uh, such a bright spot never can never be absorbed. Okay. Then we have um, Dominique Francois Jean Arago, who was the head of the committee for the competition and he did an experiment. He did an experiment um, to prove that light indeed was um, a wave. So basically he did an experiment exactly you know, to demonstrate what Poisson was arguing is not possible. So his experiment basically showed that um, indeed there will be a notice, you know, there, there will be a bright spot if you do an experiment. That's sort of like one of those uh, modern experimental results. So you can see, right, this is um, using a penny uh, to block a light. So what we see here is we see a bright spot, right? So we see a bright spot at the center, and then you see those shadows, right? Uh, just like, you know, Poisson argued, you know, you should observe, but obviously, you know, he said that, you know, you will not be able to absorb it. So basically theory shows that you should be absorbing, but he hasn't seen that before until Arago did an experiment to show that. So now it's, you know, basically that point pretty much called the Arago spot or sometimes even known as Poisson spot or uh, Fresno spot. Here I have actually a video of that. So where you can see that from the side where the light will be coming from the left side and you can think like there's an object blocking. So then when the light passes uh, the object at the center, you will see actually the bright spot. There's the black object being, you know, blocking the light. But as the light goes, you can see how at the center you see a bright spot. Okay, so that's basically the Arago spot. Again, so repeating the same experiment, light coming as a wavefront, then being some of the light being reflected when it hits the object. But then what's going through is then you can see the shadow spot and the Arago spot. Okay, so perfectly demonstrate the wave property of light. All right, so here are, here are some more examples of that. Um, so you can see then what happens when the, you see you have a, a circular disc, exactly what we just you know, looked at, and, and then you have a razor and, and, a, and a single slit. So um, one thing we're gonna do here is just, we, do, we talked about circular disc, razor here is for you an example, what you see, and um, single slit is something that we're gonna now consider in greater detail. Uh, what we do here is we assume that each eliminated by a coherent point source of monochromatic light. That means the, the wavelength of the light uh, doesn't change. That means we have, um, we don't have like a, you know, a light that has different wavelengths. So let's say it's either green or blue or yellow or thing like that. So that's kind of like what monochromatic, you know, light means. Okay. So then let's look at uh, what we call Fraunhofer diffraction patterns. Okay. So we discussed in great detail the double slit experiment where the light going through uh, two openings um, where each, right? So the, the, there's a distance D between the, you know, those slits and here's a screen when the light then spreads out like this from each opening. And then um, you have, then you see your interference pattern on the screen. So remember what one of the things we would see here is a bright spot, dark, bright, dark, bright, you know, something like this, okay. So, and each slit was acting like a, um, a point source, right? A light source. But how can you then uh, obtain a pattern of light and dark fringes from a single slit? Okay, so remember here we have 
source one, source two, two waves to interfere to give us that pattern. But then here we have just one slit. Okay, so then what causes this pattern that we see? So that's an experimental result of a single slit. So that's incoming wave as it goes through the opening, then it spreads out uh, because we assume that the, the opening is compatible to the wavelength of the light. Obviously we want that to be able to absorb a noticeable diffraction pattern. But then what we see here is um, instead of just the light going through and giving us one bright spot, we, we see basically that pattern, okay? So these are known as Fraunhofer diffraction patterns. Okay, and now we're gonna look at in terms of how we, a, we are able to uh, you know, see, see a diffraction even if we were dealing with a single slit. All right, so let's uh, think like this. Uh, the experimental result clearly shows that there is a central maxima, which we can say that this is you know, right here uh, when the theta is equal to zero degrees, right? So the bright fringe absorbed, at, you know, theta equals zero. Then what we see here is that another bright, another bright, another bright, another bright, where the, you can see, right, the, you know, the screen basically dominated by the uh, central bright fringe at theta equals zero. But then you have just alternating dark and bright fringes on each side of the central bright fringe. Okay, so a lot of times you would then take that you know, the central one and talk about the width of the central one like this. All right, so now to explain this, we will look at in terms of um, a light going through uh, an opening that has size A, okay? So we have um, a finite width of slits, right? And um, that size, you know, instead of, you know, we in, in a double slit, we use D to the lowercase D to describe the distance between the slits. That's from center of one to the center of the other one. But here we have just one slit and A represents the, the width of that slit. Okay. And then what we have is we have uh, five waves, like going through, you know, like let's say wave one, two, three, four, and five. Okay. Now, what we can do here is we can assume that the, the waves are, you know, in phase when they come in. Okay, so remember this is you know using Huygen principle. Each portion of the slit now going to be acting like a source of light waves. Okay, one thing we have then is even you know right now that now that we have just one slit, we, we we're going to see here is one thing we can think of here is the different parts of the opening then interferes with one another. Okay, so light from one portion of a slit can interfere with light from another portion. And one of the things we're gonna see that the resultant light intensity on viewing screen depends on the direction theta. For, for now, we can see that they all have this angle theta. And to derive some kind of equation, first we're gonna do, we're gonna like, let's say split this into two parts. That means we have, um, you, know, A over, you know, A over two, representing um, two different portion of the, of the slit. Okay, so divide slit into two halves. What we have is that now all waves are in phase as they leave the slit. Okay. All basically pointing in the same direction. Okay, now one thing we have here is if I consider for example, wave one and wave three. So as the wave one and wave three basically propagating forward, I can see that their difference between them is this. That means when they both reach some spot, you know, the extra distance that wave one will travel compared to wave three will be exactly this distance, okay? And since this is A over two, and this theta is same as that theta, then I can say that this distance here is A over two sine theta using just the, you know, trigonometry where the A over two here is the high you know, hypotenuse uh, and um, basically we're calculating the opposite of that triangle. All right. That means uh, ray one travels a further than the ray three by amount, which is equal to that path difference. A two sine theta, where again, A is the width of the slit. Okay. Now, if I looked at, look at then um, other rays, for example, two and four, they also have the same thing, same as let's say three and five, right? So if I look at, you know, three and five, I can also see that being exactly same distance. Okay. Now, 
if path length difference exactly half a wavelength, okay, then on the screen, on the screen, what we'll see here is we will see a dark fringe, okay? So that means they're gonna be a destructive interference if they are exactly half a wavelength apart, okay? So again, cancellation occurs for any two rays that originate at point separated by half a slit you know, width. And they are right now, you can see, right? They're separated by exactly half a slit. So one and three, exactly half a slit, right? Three and five, exactly half a slit. Well, same as uh, two and four, exactly half a slit, okay? And if they are half a slit, uh, separated by half a slit, then what you get, what you will see here is you will see then the diffraction, uh, the, the, the destructive interference and the phase difference between such points are 180 degrees. All right, so then one thing we can say is that the wave from upper half of a slit interfered destructively with the waves from the lower half, okay? So that means their path length difference, which is A over two sine theta, will equals to lambda over two. Lambda over two because this is their path difference, delta R, and it's this path length difference is exactly equals you know, half a wavelength, okay. So if then we consider uh, waves and uh, at an angle theta, so for example, if I, you know, kind of cancel those, you know, cancel those two, then I have A sine of theta equals um, lambda, then dividing both sides by A, then I can get sine of theta equals plus minus lambda over A. This is for the, you know, first, you know, let's say uh, destructive, interference okay plus minus just describe let's say if the wave's going like this compared to the, if the wave's going like that then this will give us minus oops this will give us minus and then this will give us plus so if they're going down it will you get minus if they're going uh, up they will give you plus that's why you know so like let's say you can use the symmetry right to describe back you know up and down relative to the central bright. All right, so we can also do this by dividing into, let's say four parts, right? So let's say um, instead of uh, having one half, so you can like divide this by A over four. So then if you divide by A over four, uh, still what you will see here is that you will see the dark fringes when they are, you know, uh, half a wavelength apart, right? So now what you have is that they're comparing, let's say um, one fourth, sine theta, right? So let's say one and two, two and three, and so on and so forth. So it equals to plus minus half a wavelength. So then, you know, dividing this, you get two rearranging. So then you get sine of theta equals plus minus two lambda over two, lambda over a. Okay, so like, so like, let's say what you get here is, you can in a way say that this is one over there, and now this is two over here, and we can continue like that. So we can continue like that, so let's say uh, if I go and do, uh, let's say divide it even further, right? So I have one half, you know, A, so A, A divided by, you know, two parts, then I have three parts, then I have, let's say six parts, right? So then I have A over six equals plus minus lambda over two, and then kind of rearrange algebraically, then I get sine of theta equals plus minus three times lambda over, two, over, over A. So this will give me then the third, you know, diffraction pattern and so on and so forth. That means what you see here is you get the sine of theta is proportional to lambda over A, and then you have this three here is basically, in a way gives us the position of the different dark spots. And then the general equation will be sine of theta dark equals then M times lambda a over A, where M here is what we see like one, two, three, and so on and so forth. That means it's plus minus one, plus minus two, plus minus three, and again, plus means above the central bright, minus means below the central bright. That means what we're looking at here is equation for the formation of the dark fringes. So this equation gives you uh, the positions on the screen where you have then have, let's say, so let's say, uh, let's say this is some length L and then on the screen, what you see here is position of the, you know, uh, distractive interference. Okay. So then you have a uh, dark fringes formed. So that means this is the equation. And what we have here is then, there is no equation for the bright fringes for the single slit experiment. 
What we're dealing with here is only dark fringes because we have a very bright central you know, a maxima, right? A bright fringe. And then all the other maximas are very, very uh, faint. So that means our concentration is on looking at the formation of the dark fringes. All right. And also one important thing to note is that there is no M equals zero for the dark fringes. In a double slit experiment, you had bright, but then what we had here is you have two dark, and this was M equals zero, this was M equals zero. That was two dark fringes, one above, one below of the, the, the you know, this is like, let's say double slit experiment. Where this is basically the central bright. Um, for the single slit experiment, you know, what we have here is there is no M equals zero, right? So we, when we see the graph, we will see that you basically have this is the central central bright, and then this bright, this dark, is your first minimum equals plus one, and this one is equals minus one. That means what you get here is, uh, you can see right, then this is plus two, and this is minus two, and so on and so forth. That means what you have here is, uh, the central bright, is basically, acts like a reference position like reference position. So then for example, if you calculate the distance from the central one to the first dark, then you have also the same distance from the you know, other dark below that. And then the distance from one dark above to the next dark below, then can technically give you the width of the central one. That means what is the width of the central one is the distance between plus mine and plus, mi plus one M, M equals plus one, to M equals minus one dark fringes. Okay, that means if you calculate, you know, the distance for this minimum, so then this theta can be doubled to find then the, the width either in theta, in radians or in degrees uh, or, or in meters for the, um, for the central bright. Okay, so again, so this equation, um, so a sine of theta is equals to M times um, lambda, right? So this will be then for the calculation, um, if I divide by A as well. So this will be the calculation for the dark. So that's why I put like D for the dark, okay? So remember again, M is equals to plus minus one, plus minus two, that, 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 okay? So now, if the theta is relatively small, so let's say the theta here is under five degrees, then this equation can be simplified to theta d because then you know sine of theta is approximately theta. Then this will be then m lambda over a. So you can write it like that. So that means you know what we have here is we can calculate then um, that position uh, in terms of uh, angular position. So you can have uh, either theta or um, like let's say either degrees or radians. So again, this equation here shows you that, you know, um, M equals zero is absent, right? So there is no M equals zero. And the central bright maximum is twice as wide as the secondary maxima, okay? So um, one thing we have here is, so you can rewrite this for the small theta when theta is small. So then you can say that theta dark is equal to M times lambda over A. Then similar way, we can say that if this is length L, I can find maybe then the Y position of the dark spot, right? I can find the Y position of the dark. So for that, I again use Y equals L tangent of theta, right? So let's say this is, you know, what, you know, right now we're only dealing with dark, so it doesn't really matter. So, so let's say uh, M is the order, right? A uh, mode order. So L tangent of theta, but since you know theta is approximately sine of theta, approximately tangent of theta, I can also say this is L times theta. M. And since theta M is this, I can then relate Y of M as um, M lambda L over A. So this is basically uh, finding the linear position. 
So this, this here, here your result will be in degrees. So here your result will be in radians and here your result will be in, let's say meters, right? So this is, you get the linear position and those are how things related. If the angle theta is not small, then you cannot make that, you know, um, let's say uh, combination, right? You cannot combine those together. So then you have just two, right? You know, here's will be the first one and here's will be the second one uh, equation dealing with a, a, a single slit. That means if your thetas are large, you, 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 know, you basically use those equations. If your thetas are small and you, you can uh, pretty much make this calculation in terms of that. So in any case, one thing you can do here, you can just calculate theta um, basically using this equation over there and then see if your theta is small or not, if you can make the assumption. But sometimes once you calculate the theta, then you can just plug it into this equation and just use y equals L tangent of theta instead. All right, so those are in a way the only differences that we have for the double slit and single slit. For the double slit, we calculate both dark fringes and bright fringes. And there is uh, m equals zero, two m equals zero for the uh, dark fringes. For the single slit, we only calculate the dark fringes. And there is no m equals zero for the dark fringes. And we don't even bother ever calculating anything about a bright fringe unless we're calculating the width of the, uh, let's say, central bright. So you can, you know, you can also kind of calculate that. All right, so let's look at a few examples. A coherent microwaves or wavelength five, five centimeter and a tall, narrow window in a building otherwise essentially opaque to the microwaves. If the window is 36 centimeter wide, what is the distance from the central maximum to the first order minimum along the wall, 6.5 meter from the window? All right, so what we can see from here is that we're given wavelength, which is five centimeters. We're given that the window is 36 centimeter wide. That means that's our A. And the wall here is 6.5 meter away from us. So that means that's our L. All right, so then what we do here is, as I said, right? So since we don't know if the theta is gonna be large or not, so we go ahead and use this uh, equation of sine of theta. So we wanna know the first order minimum, which means that, you know, M equals one. So then sine of theta is equals to M lambda over A. So from here, then we can calculate taking the M equals one. So I can say that is one times five centimeters, then divided by 36 centimeters. I, I don't have to convert to meters because both of them are centimeters. So units cancel out, okay? So then what we get here is we get 0.139 and then I do inverse sine, inverse sine of 0.139 to solve for theta, theta of one, 0.139 then we can get theta one to be 7.98 degrees. Okay, so that's basically the um, distance from the central maximum to the first order, um, sorry, like first order minimum. But here's the thing, when it says distance, uh, it generally means that vertical distance. So we got this, we got theta, but then what, what we need actually is y one. So which is now, now has L tangent of theta equation because theta is you know, uh, larger than five degrees. So we then put 6.5 meters, that's our L, then tangent of 7.98 degrees. Then we're gonna calculate 91.2, uh, then you just basically convert it into centimeters. So 91.2 centimeters, that means uh, going from central bright to the, um, let's say, first dark, it's going to be almost a meter. That's why when the openings are really large, you don't really see the absorb that uh, diffraction patterns. All right, here's another example. A screen is placed 50 centimeters from a single slit, which is illuminated by a, a, with light of wavelength 690 nanometers. 
If the distance between the first and third minima in the diffraction pattern is three millimeters, what is the width of the slit? All right, so in this case, we have um, the screen is placed 50 centimeters, so that's our L. So let's write as 0.5 meters. Um, and a light has a wavelength of 690 nanometers, 690 times 10 to the negative nine meters. And it says if the distance between the first and the third minima is in the diffraction pattern is three millimeters, that means we're basically given the distance, right? So like, like this del delta, you know, delta Y between those two. See the units are in millimeters, so that's the vertical distance, okay? That means for example, let's um, do, you know, let's say here's, my, here's our opening. So this is A, and let's say here's our screen. So then what we're saying here is that distance L here is 0.5 meters. So what we're gonna here observe is, here's the central bright, which is very, you know, uh, very bright compared to all the other, uh, you know, the, the maxima. So then here's a dark, and then here's gonna be another dark, and then here's gonna be, let's say another dark, right? So for example, and then, you know, a little bright here. So this is M equals one, this is M equals two, and this is M equals three. So then this distance, so this distance here is then three millimeters. That means the distance, uh, sorry, not this distance, this is between first and third. That means uh, this distance here. So this distance here is then three millimeters. Okay. All right, so then, um, which we can say that, let's say our delta Y, right? Delta Y, where this is Y, you know, three minus Y one, basically. All right, so from here, what we do is we, um, we look at in terms of uh, Y equals L tangent of theta, okay? And Y equals L tangent of theta, and then this will be a uh, sine of theta equals m lambda over a. Okay. Now, generally when we're dealing with a small wavelength like that, uh, light going through a open, you know, small opening, we can assume that um, thetas are small. So if the thetas are small, so we can say sine of theta is approximately theta is approximately tangent of theta. Okay. So then I can say y over l, which is equals to tangent of theta, is approximately theta, approximately sine of theta, that means it's equals to m lambda over a. Okay, so that means it's equals to m lambda over a. Now we are given that um, delta y is equals to three millimeters, so which means it's three times 10 to the negative three meters. Okay. And what we have here is, in a way, let's say right now, if I do uh, come back to this equation, let's call this equation one. So my equation one, it says Y over L. Okay. So that means what I can do here is I can say this is then um, Delta Y over L is equals to then um, Delta M times Lambda over A. Because what I have here is, um, I have two different order, right? So I have the delta M and delta Y, two things that represent those um, different, you know, fringes. So I can see that my delta M is a uh, difference between, you know, third and one. So three minus one equals two, okay? And delta Y here is, you know, given like that, which is just three millimeters. So then taking equation, uh, equation one, let's call this then equation two, because now I'm doing in terms of change then I can just rearrange and solve for A. A is equals to delta M lambda times L over delta Y. Okay, so then it's equals to then, uh, delta M here is just two times lambda is 690 times 10 to the negative nine meters. 
then L here is 0.5 meters. Then this is divided by delta Y, which is three times 10 to the negative three meters, which is the three millimeters. I do that calculation. So for A, and I'm gonna get 2.30 times 10 to the negative four meters. That's the calculation then for the A. That means this, the, the width of the slit is uh, roughly 0 0.3, uh, 0 0.23 millimeters. Okay. So that's, you know, how, to, how we can, again, we can see, right, when the angle is small, we can rearrange and solve for, um, so for position. So that's why when it's asking for the distance, um, you generally ask to calculate um, the, the linear position, which is gonna be sort of like in meters. All right, so next, next let's look at the uh, uh, intensity of a single slit diffraction patterns. All right, so then analysis for that will show us that in intensity uh, will be given with this equation over here, where intensity is equals to the maximum intensity, where the maximum intensity always represents the intensity of the central bright spot. And that always will happen when theta equals uh, zero degrees. And um, then what we have the wavelength is the wavelength of, of the light used to eliminate slit. And generally remember, we're using monochromatic light. That means it's always gonna be just one specific wavelength, right? That means one thing we can see from this uh, the diagram over here is that if we plot then the intensity um, in terms of the, the intensity graph, so you will see that uh, this is for the theta, intensity versus theta. So the when theta equals zero, then the, you get the maximum intensity. That's for the central bright, okay? Then the first dark one will happen when the theta equals negative pi or when it equals to pi. That means you get those first uh, dark above and below the central one. And then the second dark will be when the theta equals two pi or negative two pi. And then you can see right three pi and so on and so forth. So this graph demonstrates in terms of like, let's say what will be the theta, right? For the, for the intensity for the orders of, you know, M equals plus minus one, plus minus two and so on and so forth. So this is basically for the uh, a single slit experiment intensity for that. Right. So sometimes you can just take a ratio of intensity or, you know, uh, divided by the maximum intensity. And we can see that the graph, um, the shape of the graph changes significantly when you have uh, n number of slits. So we're gonna talk about diffraction, you know, the diffraction grading when you may have many different slits. But over here, so let's say you have, um, uh, let's say n number of slits. So the first one gives you the n equals two, which is a double slit experiment. But then you can have, uh, and this is something we looked at in the previous chapter, that we have n equals three. And you can see, right, when n equals three, then what you get here, you get not only primary, but you can also get the secondary maximum. Okay, then n equals four, then you can see again, now you get, you know, uh, two secondary maximum, right? N equals five, N equals 10. And what we get every time, you know, you have larger, higher the value of the, you know, the slits, the narrower the, the maximum, right? So, and you can see that they're getting closer and closer to one another. And what we can see for N equals 10, your, um, you know, the maximums are much closer to one another, right? So it's, uh, you know, and you can see that more you increase the number of slits, the, the closer, you know, closer that maximum is gonna to be to one another. That means you basically uh, kind of like not an envelope like that, right? So like a more like a straight line becomes. So that's something we're gonna see in a little bit later on when we um, uh, look at uh, diffraction grading. Okay. So we can also, again, uh, kind of like analyze the two slit diffraction pattern. And one of the things we can see here is if you look at it sort of like as a whole, right? So, you know, you know, um, instead of maybe like, let's say looking at the, this, you know, uh, small region of the diffraction, you know, the, the, the double slit uh, diffraction pattern. So if you just look at this, you know, uh, and this is what we looked at in the previous chapter, uh, you basically see that the central one uh, is just a slightly, you know, um, brighter than uh, the first, uh, order minimum, a uh, maximum, like let's say M equals zero for the maximum, 
is uh, brighter than m equals plus minus one, but not by much. And m equals, you know, plus minus two is a little bit fainter, plus minus three, so on. But, you know, more or less, you know, uh, for this region, right, the intensity decreases, um, not like, let's say, significantly, like we saw for the uh, single slit. But then if you kind of um, look at the combined equation, right, you can see that you can more or less uh, model it as well. This one, just like the, the a single slit. So what you have, this is, you know, can be considered the entire bright, central bright, right? So that means, you know, this is the, the central bright, and then this is the secondary bright and so on and so forth. So you can kind of look at it in terms of this. And then the combined equation uh, will be then, um, so this is the, you know, the intensity for the double slit diffraction patterns. So pretty much combining those equations for the double slit and the single slit. So uh, you get uh, pretty much this equation. So you have I, which is I max times cosine square then you have the argument of the cosine squared times the ratio of sine of pi a sine theta over lambda divided by pi a sine theta over lambda quantity squared. Okay, so this again represents single slit diffraction pattern factor in the square brackets acting as an envelope for a double, you know, two slit interference pattern, which is a cosine squared factor. All right, so let's look at an example here. Uh, the fraction pattern is formed on a screen 12 centimeter away from a 0.4 millimeter wide slit. Calculate the fractional intensity I over I max at the point on the screen 4.1 millimeter from the central, uh, from the center of the principal maximum. All right, so let's then do this calculation. So we're given that a pattern is you know, formed on a screen 112 centi 120 centimeter away, that's our L. And it's a monochromatic 546.1 uh, nanometer light, that's our wavelength. And um, we're told that calculate the fractional intensity I over I max at the point on the screen, 4.1 millimeter from the center of the principal maximum. That means that basically, you know, um, we're given our y position, right? So y is equals to 4.1 times 10 to the negative 3 meters. Okay, so obviously then this one will be times 10 to the negative 9 meters, and this one will be then 1.20 meters. Having everything in, in meters, generally good idea. All right, so here then, uh, what we have is the equation. Um, so for a, um, a single slit, right, uh, is I equals I max. Then we had sine of pi A sine of theta over lambda uh, over pi A sine of theta over lambda than the quantity squared. Okay, so that's our equation. But we want the, the ratio of I over I max. That means, you know, basically divide both sides by I max. Okay, get rid of that. So that means this is what we want. All right, so that means uh, one of the things we wanna know here is um, sort of like, let's say, what is, um, let's say, sine of theta. Okay, so because that's kind of like, you know, one of the things we want, right, sine of, uh, theta divided by lambda. So if we can calculate that, then we should be able to get that. Okay. By the way, like let's say in this equation is not sine of theta divided by lambda, but sort of like, let's say the argument is not theta divided by lambda, is that sine of theta divided by lambda. And like, you know, wanna make sure that you guys are aware of that. So let's say. All right, so then uh, this is equals to, okay. So um, that means we, don't, we need to know what the sine of theta is. Okay. So uh, we are given L, lambda and Y, and those are in a way good enough for us to find, because again, using the 
sine of theta, approximately theta, approximately uh, tangent of theta. So I can calculate this. Remember, one equation for sine of theta, uh, for sine of theta was m lambda over a. But I don't know what the value of um, a is at the, at the moment, right? So I don't know what, what that value is, um, but um, let's see. Actually, I do have, sorry. I just noticed that I did not write that down. So A is also given to us and it's 0 0.4, 0 0.4. Uh, so basically 0.4 millimeter or we can just write as 4.0 times 10 to the negative four meters. That's also given to us. All right, so either way. So sine of theta equals M lambda over A, um, but you know, um, this is also equals to um, the tangent of theta and tangent of theta is equals to y over L. Okay. So, uh, and y over L, so I'm given my y, I'm given the L um, and we can just use that. So uh, y is given as 4.1 times 10 to the negative three meters divided by L is given as 1.20 meters meters cancel out. So we're going to get and calculate 3.417 times 10 to the negative three. The, you know, just a unitless quantity. That means now I know what my sine of theta is. So then one thing I can do here is inside, right? So you can see that um, here I have, this one says pi A sine of theta over lambda. And at the bottom, I have them pi a sine of theta over lambda. And remember, I cannot cancel it those because you know, the, the, the numerator is, in, is an argument of another sign. So that's why I cannot cancel any of those things. But since I have sine of theta, I can say that if I do pi times a sine of theta over lambda, then I can basically calculate those quantities. So I already have sine of theta is equals to that. So then I can say pi times a and a is four times 10 to the negative four meters, then times sine of theta, which is 3.417 times 10 to the negative three, then divided by the wavelength, which is given as 546.1 times 10 to the negative nine meters. So you can see, right, meters cancel out and I have just a radiant, which is basically exactly what I want. Um, so this is then gonna give me 7.8862 radians then I can take that and plug it into this equation because now I have you know, a sine of that argument, which is pi A sine of theta over lambda, which is 7 point, sorry, 7.86862 radians, then divided by um, 7.862 radians, okay, then quantity squared. So if I calculate this, uh, I will get 1.6, 1.62 times 10 to the negative two. That means that the ratio here is uh, 1.62 times 10 to the negative two. And that's my uh, answer for the, you can see, right? The fractional intensity at the point on the screen, 4.1 millimeter from the central. That means it decreased by that much, okay? Remember, the, the intensity at the central one is uh, I max. And if I do I over I max for the central one, right? So uh, I'm going to get one. But here, you know, I get a decrease in intensity by that much.